Welcome back to JB Squared, stage 19 of the 2023 Tour de France. I'm JB Hager. Uh, more importantly than my presence is Johan Brunil to break down everything, tell you what's going on in the race, what to look for, and just a very, very tough stage again. Uh, we'll get into all the details of how that breakaway happened and some, you know, some some uh, breakdown of a sprint finish when it's going to be a photo finish, how to win that. Uh, we'll do all that and more on this episode of JB Squared. Okay, we'll start out with some very lighthearted good news. Uh, uh, birth of a, another baby for Wout Van Aert. Yeah. Um, he, he got home just in time, I guess. I mean, that guy just does everything perfect. You know, he just <laughs> he, he went home and, you know, perfect timing. Um, I, mean, I, I, I think I read somewhere before the tour that the baby was actually planned to be born straight after the tour. like in the week between the tour and the, and the world championship. So uh, he got home right on time. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, he didn't get his stage win, but I think he would not change any stage win with what happened uh, last night. And uh, so, yeah, congrats to Wout and his wife. And um, yeah, I'm, you know, I think everybody's happy to see that he, uh, he took the right decision. Yeah. And I, I wonder if he's happy with his tour, um, you know, because, of course, he was very close on, on there were a lot of opportunities for him to win stages. Didn't work out his way, but man, what a work workhorse. What an, yeah. an amazing athlete. It, you know what, JB? I mean, it's, it's the same goes for Matthew van der Poel, for example. You know, most likely he he won't win a stage in this tour either. Uh it doesn't really change anything for those guys. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't change anything to their status. It doesn't change anything to their contracts. It doesn't change anything to their bonus system because, you know, at that, at that, those kind of salaries, I would imagine you're not getting a bonus to win a Tour de France stage. You're expected to win several Tour de France stages. So, um, you know, they, they know that they did a good, a good race and uh, so be it, you know, I mean, they've tried and, uh, it, it'll be, it'll have to be for another time. Yeah. And if, you know, if you're new to following cycling and you know, those names are big, it may not make sense to you that they don't have a tour win, but if you've been listening to the show for the last seven years, uh, then you've learned, you know, and how valuable they are as a tool, both of those riders. And yeah. And then the yeah. fans who understand cycling appreciate everything they've done in this tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, independently whether they've won or not, they have, They've given a great show. Mm -hmm. You know, they they're they're entertaining. They're an ex incredible asset to any team. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, winning is it's not easy, and it becomes more and more difficult to win stages in the Tour de France. If you look, you know, we've done 19 stages now, and 15 different riders have won a stage. Um, the only rider who won several stages is uh, is Jasper Philipsen, who he won four. Who is, everybody else when yeah and Jasper's likely a favorite on sunday as well which yeah i mean he's for sure with the winner of the green jersey already and then you know the big favorite for for sunday on the champs Elysees. all right let's talk about today's stage uh how tell everybody about how fast it was and how these breaks went down how and, and then you can also explain to uh our listeners, how, how that, how dynamic it becomes this far into the tour when you don't have someone in that breakaway, what, yeah, the, what could, the directors do to those teams. We could see that clearly today, you know, I mean, for, once again, from the gun, uh, there was attacks. Uh, it, it took a very, very long time for the first real breakaway. What seemed to be the breakaway of the day uh, to go, it, it took 55 kilometers um, you know, at the speed they went, that's probably an hour. <laughs> I, I, I would like to see the, the average speed of the first hour. Uh, you know, there was even a climb in there, a fourth category climb, but, um, and it had to be really strong riders to go in those breaks. So the first break, the, the, the first group that, which I thought, okay, this group is gone. You know, you have Victor Kampenarts, Mats Peterson, Matteo Trentin, Niels Pollitt, Tish Penot, Warren Bargill, Ala Philippe. Uh, Jack Haig and uh, Zimmerman, you know, that's like a group. Okay. He said, okay, that's over. That's they're gone. 
nobody can nobody can catch this this group right and then two things happen first of all you have teams who are not represented and not just one but three teams joined forces and started to chase you know as israel premier tech and then you know x and ef they they were not represented and uh for sure they got the message from the the, the car okay guys we said this morning do not miss a break like this you know and so on one hand, one side it's a bit of a I'm not going to say a punishment, but it's like, okay, we have no option. This is our last chance. So right. we what, well, so you, you, the other option is just to sit in that bunch all day and do nothing, be irrelevant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They know they're not going to win tomorrow or, or on, or on Sunday. If, if there was something to save a rider for, that would be different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. That's yeah. That's not the case. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the the strong collaboration of these three teams, first of all, made it that the the, the gap didn't really go out very far. Uh, and then another in- incident happened. This uh, Niels Pollitt, we already saw yesterday that he, uh, you know, his his contribution to the chase. Finally, they didn't catch the break yesterday, but he looked really strong yesterday. He was one of the big favorites for today for the stage. He was in the group. And finally, uh, all of a sudden, we see that he uh, he breaks his chain, which you know, and is is something strange to happen. So I don't exactly understand how that happened. He must have shifted the wrong way, and then the, the chain got stuck and bended, uh, yeah. and then finally finally breaks. Because you know what, these guys, those teams, they have so much equipment that you know chains they change them. I mean. They're checked constantly. Whenever there's a little bit of play on the chain, it's a new chain, it's new tires, it's new cassettes, new chain rings, new brake pads, whatever, you know? Um, so, uh, but here, and, and we can see this here in this in this video, so he breaks the chain and then, you know, he has this, there's no cars. The, the team cars are not behind the, the, the breakaway because they're not far enough. Then you have to rely on the neutral car of Shimano. So the neutral car, they have these uh, these bikes that usually they have different sizes. So we see that he he tries three different bikes. You know, the first one is too small. The second one is the wrong pedals. The third one he gets on, it's again too small. And then he says, you know, uh, what? It's, it, it's, <clears throat> that's so frustrating, you know, yeah. so frustrating. And he was, you know, he was getting angry at the guy from Shimano. Yeah. You know, it was he was super frustrated. It's not the guy sh- of Shimano's fault either. You know, no, I mean, no. First of, all, first of all, there's maybe three guys in the whole peloton that are the size of Niels Pollitt, right? He's super tall. Yeah. So, um, and 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 the Shimano cars, they have to make sure that they have the sizes, but also the seat heights that kind of fit. You know, most of the guys, right? Uh, and so, and then, and then you, on top of that, you have different pedals on different teams. So, uh, it was a bit of a, a bit of a mess as we saw, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's super unfortunate. So then, uh, Paul, it being one of the strongest guys that the, the engine who was basically carrying the breakaway, uh, went away. And, um, and so, yeah, then finally, uh, they didn't catch the break, but after the, intermediate sprint that's that was a bit uh, strange so you had a few guys sprinting and then those teams like for example israel and you know x um and ef all of a sudden they they kept going and alpes in phoenix so these these teams had multiple riders you know x had actually all of a sudden from no riders they had four riders in the breakaway because the, the there was about 20 riders that kind of went away after that sprint and uh, could catch up to the to the nine to the eight guys and uh and so finally we had like uh 25 27 guys um from then on it was clear okay now you know there's nobody who, who, who was gonna catch this as long as there's cooperation in the front uh nobody else was interested in the in the peloton to and everybody was super tired because it had been incredible fast pace until then and so that breakaway kept going um and then from then on we know okay this is 
this is going to be the stage winner in this in this area. But then you get the race within the race, right? The break. Then it's about trying to get into the breakaway from the breakaway, <laughs> right? Which which is all always always and a, a combination of talented riders and fatigue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so in fatigue, talking about fatigue, JB. You know, at this point in the in the tour, you know, you see things that you would never see. Uh, in other races or in <clears throat> in the first half of the tour, at some point we had from those twenty five riders, we had two riders go to the front. It was Victor Campanarts again after yesterday's huge effort, and uh, Simon Clark from uh, Israel. So these two guys, they you know they were riding well together, and they got like. 35 40 seconds and all of a sudden on that little climb uh you see just a pure like a big explosion of simon clark looked like cramps uh but basically the guy was just all of a sudden done like he could you know couldn't pedal anymore yeah and, yeah yeah and you don't see that very often that no, much fatigue right no 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 and then and then a little bit later um when we saw finally the three strong guys which finally sprinted it out for the finish was uh, As Green and Mohoric and uh, O'Connor. They went on that last climb. Uh, it was super hard to, to. I mean, everybody knew that that was going to be an attack. So basically, there you could see, okay, these guys are the strongest. Campanarts got caught. He was base. I mean, he tried to stay with them. I mean, literally two seconds. Yeah, and he, he just was... blew up. Same thing, mm -hmm. right? So there you see that the peloton is really so, so, so fatigued. Uh, but then finally, if the race finishes, the stage finishes, and you see the average speed, 49.1 kilometers average speed for a stage 19. And, and not a flat stage. I mean, a, a, a hilly stage, you know, not, not uh, I mean, not big hills, but still. Um, that's That's so impressive. So impressive. You know, the fifth fastest stage in the in the history of the tour uh but i think it's the first time that it's such a high speed so late in the tour de france you know if i i mean i think the fast the fastest stage is cipollini uh but that was in the first week that's 50 plus something or that i still have the third the third fastest stage by the way uh, is that right which one yeah. was that that was also that was stage six so first uh First week of the tour, stage six in, in 93, uh, also 49.5 kilometers per hour. Um, but I, I finished alone, so <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping that as my pr proud moment, you know? Because <laughs> today, today I had a discussion with my son, you know, like uh, he knew I had once the, the fastest stage because when I won, it was the fastest stage in history. Uh, and then, you know, and, and then he, and then I told him, yeah, you know, but they beat it. And so he was disappointed. And today I said, you know, fifth fastest stage in, in the history of the tour, you know, and he said, and, and your stage, mm. I said, third, third fastest. He said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. That's, I mean, when you look at, if yours was the third fastest and you look at all the changes just in the bikes yeah. alone, and then you add in the changes in, in the 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 athletes, the, their nutrition. Oh, yeah. There's just yeah. a million factors. That, so that's remarkable. That you're just still yeah. in the top five. Yeah, I was. Still, I mean, I have to say, in that stage, I was. I, it was still. Uh, I think it's the only stage that's in there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, with down tubes shifting. Oh man. Yeah, <laughs> I never even owned a bike when down to shift shifting down tube exists. Shift. I mean, I should have, but I never. I didn't take up riding a bike till I was <laughs> twenty seven. So I missed all that. I missed all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Just JB, before we, we we talk about tomorrow, I want to uh, <clears throat> talk a little bit about the three guys who who went away, right? Uh, and and why they why they had such a big chance to stay away, right? Um, so we have, we have, uh, Casper Asgreen. I mean, once again, after the stage win of yesterday, the fact that he was there again and so strong, amazing. We had Ben O'Connor, you know, big, big engine, great, like great rider to, to, to be in a breakaway and Matej Mohoric, the three guys, first of all, 
the three guys, three stage winners in the tour already. They already knew what they want, what, what it is to win a stage in the tour. <clears throat> so from there on, you could see already, okay, these three, it's going to be very difficult. But there was still some, you know, possibility. There was interest in the in the following group, you know, but the, uh, uh, Philipson had uh, Van der Poel there. There were some other riders. Pedersen was there. Uh, but the fact that these sprinters were there, you know, like especially Philipson and Pedersen was basically the key to success of those three guys who were in front because it's, you know, the, all the other riders with them, they're only going to give 80% because they say, why, why would we just here give 100% to catch these guys if we know that when we catch them, these these guys are going to beat me in the sprint anyway, one right, of one right. of the two. So, so that was... Uh, you could see that there was there was agreement, but not full commitment. That's what happens when you have these strong sprinters and breakaways that nobody really wants. To. And on top of that, then you have Mate, uh, Mathieu van der Poel, who also is you know a winner of stages. So the other five or six guys there, they would say, okay, you know, we'll 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 pull, but you know, it's going to be 75, 80 percent, not 100 mm-hmm. percent. And that worked and, in the favor of those those top three. And 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 uh, yeah. and then I know you also wanted to talk about that sprint. It was, I mean, yeah. uh, the the TV coverage, the TV feed. We saw it from the front. There was no telling who won that, and it came came no. down to a, a a tire width. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think this there was two things that happened in that sprint. So finally, you know, first of all, these guys had to commit to go until the last six seven hundred meters. Like, otherwise, there was always going to be this doubt that if they slow down and they start to look at each other, uh, that they could come back from the back. So they that's what they did. Great. You know, then the logical thing happened. The guy who knew that he had no chance in a sprint, Ben O'Connor, he launched from, he tried to surprise them. You know, he, he when you see it from behind, he kind of lets himself drop a little bit because they're not going full gas anymore. So when he gets to the to their position, he's already on speed. He tried to attack. He got a little gap. And Casper Asgreen looks, reacts immediately, but he still has to close a little gap. You know, so that's already a little effort. And basically from there on, he's starting, he starts to be the lead out guy of Matej Mohoric. Mm-hmm. Um now I think the the, the one the one mistake that Casper Asgreen makes is that when he gets back to Ben O'Connor, he does not pause. He does not wait a little bit. He just goes on with his momentum and starts to sprint from far away. Uh, obviously he feels he's strong and, and he was, I mean, the result shows that he was super strong, but I think that if he waits a little bit and gets a little bit in the slipstream of O'Connor and starts I mean, so uh, listen, at the end, it's always so easy to say if you would have done this. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I'm just trying to. I know. And as a, as a bike racer, you, you you can't beat yourself up over that. Look at how many times but, they, but, they but, line up. But let me year. tell you, <laughs> let me tell you, when Asgreen's going to see and repeatedly the images, he's going to say, if I would have yeah. paused a little bit there, I've got this. I, I would have gotten this, you know. And then finally, they, you know, it looks like Asgreen is going to get it. Finally, Mohoric, uh, it's actually not Mohoric, it's Mohoric. It's Mohoric. It's not Mohoric. I checked with Slovenian friends. <laughs> okay. Mohoric. Mohoric. No. <laughs> Mo- no. I'll just On say Ma- first- Mate. Mate, <laughs> Mohoric. Mohoric. Not, not Mohoric, it's Mohoric. Mohoric, got it. Same as it's, it's not, it's not, it's not. Pogachar, it's Pogachar. Pogachar. Now that one I've been saying right. Pogacar. I've been saying that one right. But people say Pogachar, Pogacar, Pogachar. Right, <laughs> right. Um, okay, Ma- and then Mate, uh, Mate, so the, so the, here we see this the the, the picture right uh, of the of the photo finish. Um, you see Mohoric. No, sorry. You see Mohoric <laughs> throw the bike. Asgreen also throws the bike, but not the same. And, uh, you know, I think it comes down sometimes to that last pedal stroke when you decide to throw the bike 
And in my opinion, the, the last pedal stroke of, of Asgreen was not right on point to throw the bike. And that's how the Slovenian rider wins the stage with, you know, such a small difference. Third victory for Bahrain. Um, amazing. You know, like they, they won with Peyo Bilbao. They won with Wout Pools. Now with Mohoric, this is the third stage win for him also uh, in the Tour de France. And, and I mean, you know, that, that interview, JB, after the stage, I was like, wow, you know, this, it's, it was unbelievable. The, the, the explosion of, you know, accumulated tension, frustration, suffering. Uh, it's kind, it's kind of strange to see, because let's not forget, you know, this is a guy who won Lies Baston Liege. Multiple world champion in the he was I think he was two times world champion in the juniors and one time in the under twenty three. Uh, this is a guy who's won a lot of races already, like a lot of races. To see him so emotional was um, for different reasons, of course. Like I think you know the main reason that he was so emotional, and it's I've read that it's it's a topic that they try not to talk about. Uh, but it's of course the passing away of Gino Mater before before the Tour de France. That's yeah. the main. I mean, it's still it's yeah. it's. Uh, I spoke. I've, I've spoken to some people, uh, like uh, one of the staff members of Bahrain, uh, who was in the Tour of Switzerland, who was actually at the at the scene. Uh, and, you know, and he says it's it's you know it's something in the team that we we try not to talk about it because it's so hurtful. Um, and so I think that's the main reason why they're so emotional. You know, the three guys who won on Bahrain were super emotional. Uh, that's the reason, of course. And, but in, in, in the case of Mohoric, that also, it, you know, you could see that he's now, well, I mean, you would say, you would say he's, he's a, he's a veteran rider. He's, he's actually not, he's not that old, you know, he is, uh, Let's see. He's only 28 years old. Oh, you know, he's yeah. he uh he's a professional already since 2013. No, 2014. So he was 19 when he turned pro. And obviously he has seen the evolution of pro cycling. And now and that's what he said in his interview, right? It's you have to, you know, to be on top. It goes so fast. There's so many guys who prepare themselves 100%, you know, and then it gets really super difficult to be ready for a race. And then you show up at a race and all you see, well, there's 60, 70 other guys who are the same like me. Yeah. You know, so yeah, the, 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 the talent pool as a whole is, is so deep. And, you know, right. I, was th I was thinking about it too, when you, you talk about 19 stages of, of hard fatigue, I'm, I'm thinking about our listeners, you, you know, our listeners may have done, you know, their first century ride or their first marathon or first Ironman and gotten emotional at the end because of all the work they put into it. Imagine that of being your, your profession. And then yeah. the, the, the three weeks that they've been through already this year is unbelievable. Yeah. But I think it's not just the three weeks, JB. I mean, and, and particularly this tour, once again, we'll see the, We'll see at the end the average speed. Um, we don't know yet how fast it's going to be, but you know that all these stages we've seen they've been fought for from start to finish. As we said, you know, there's no more time for relaxing in the pedal. Today was like from the gun. Yesterday from the gun. Every single day it's like 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 the juniors race. Um, and so fast, you know, so. Uh, well, well, you mentioned, uh, you, you know, you had the third fastest ever in like from that era on a typical tour, how many days would you say were relaxing days as you described? Like you were like, Hey, well, no worries. Yeah. Um, obviously there were a lot of, a lot of rate, a lot of stages where you kind of knew that that was going to be the outcome, the sprint stages. So there was typically, you know, this three four guys then in the peloton it was easy you could chat with friends from other teams um 
also, I mean, something, of course, we've talked already about this in, in other podcasts, the fact that it's televised from start to finish has changed tremendously. <laughs> you can't just Before, it was laughing. I was, I was listening. <laughs> I was listening to, uh, to Sean Kelly yesterday or the day before and you know he uh i raced with sean but you know he when he st when he was a young professional uh he, the the patron of the peloton was bernard you know you know like he was the guy who was winning the tour then and he won five tours finally and and he was you know it was okay today guys this is what's gonna happen it's a sprint stage you know until you hear the helicopter from the TV, you don't move. <laughs> Nobody moved. It was like, okay, fine. You know, the, and there were, there were, there's one mm. instance, for example, very famous instance, that there was one young rider, a French rider, his name is Joel Pellier. Um, he did not listen to what the guys had agreed upon and he attacked. <laughs> and he you know personally went to get him and he actually slapped him. <laughs> no, no, there's images of that. I'll try, I'll try to find it. He slapped it and he said, "Hey, what are you back. doing?" <laughs> yeah, and he went back. Wow. Yeah. Is there yeah. a is there a patron of the Peloton right now? No, no. There's no. not. Nobody could take no. charge like that, huh? No, there's no more patron. Uh, it's it's that's finished. That's you know the, and that's also because back then you had to kind of have a certain age to be able to impose yourself on the race now these young guys come and they're good straight away you know back then it was okay you know and you, you need three four tour de france in your legs to be able to say okay i'm i'm here and i can i can do this you know there were there were more unwritten rules back in the day many <laughs> many, <laughs> right? many many we could do many shows on that maybe we'll do yeah, a but special I think, one i think one of the one of the main things is the tv coverage uh it makes no sense to it makes no sense to be 60k in the front and then you get caught just before the tv coverage starts you know what for you know right at least all these guys that go now they're sure that they're on tv you know it's not even just the tv there's a camera there's thousands and thousands of cameras on them at any given moment yeah like what are you doing <laughs> It's yeah. really interesting. Interesting. So that with the cameras everywhere in everyone's pocket, that you know, the era of holding on the cars and <laughs> oh, it's finished. And fans pushing you up the hills like yeah, they used to. Yeah, I mean, you know, there there was there was a time also. Um, I mean, not I don't think so much in the tour, but like for example, world championships. Um there and there are there are images, and it was it was done back then that uh the leader of the, there's for example there's one particular guy who won the world championships and they went like it was like 20 laps or something over a climb and during 10 laps he was just literally holding on to the pants of a teammate they just pulled him up <laughs> like to, to save energy right right yeah, yeah. anyway it, it's better that it's not done but uh, you know every era has its you know, rules and unwritten rules. So um, he was still the best amongst his generation, this guy, you know? Yeah. Today's show is brought to you by Ventum. Check out the all new GS1, the gravel bike. And you may not know this, but you can get into a brand new GS1 with SRAM Apex AXS for just $29.99. That's a, and that's a great bike. This is in fact, the bike with the that we used for Operation Get Out, where we took a bunch of people to George's Fondo. It was their first gravel bike ever. Everybody is thrilled about that bike. And then, of course, the same frame on that GS1 could be on a, uh, a GS1 that you've built out with higher-end components. It's always up to you. And you'll see when you're on their website how you can pick and build it up, keep the cost down if that's important to you, or just go crazy on all the components you want types of handlebars you want, upgraded wheels if you want. Uh, it's a very, very user-friendly website and fun to build out, build out your bike. So go give it a shot. Go check it out at uh, VentumRacing.com. And you can get 10% off when you use the code we do at checkout at VentumRacing.com slash the move. Today's show is also brought to you by Ketone IQ. I've got the bottle right here for those of you watching on YouTube. This is the bottle of 10 shots. 
So just part of your routine, you know, just first thing in the morning, I do a shot of this and uh, I've told you on this uh, previous shows on this tour, it's helped with mental clarity, sharpness, sustained energy. One of my favorite side effects that it, it, I just dawned on me a couple of weeks ago is I've gone from having four or five cups of coffee every morning uh, down to one. And it's, 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 uh, purely because of the ketone IQ that I'm having before that. I don't know. It's, and it's just really helped a lot with, uh, you know, focus and energy, like I mentioned, but also gut health. Cause I'm not drinking all that coffee. So try a subscription to it, get it sent to you on a regular basis, give it a few months. I, I guarantee you, you're going to feel different, uh, not only physically, which Lance and George talked quite a bit about, but also the mental part of it. So, uh, do a subscription. 30% off on your first subscription of Ketone IQ. And that is at hvmn.com slash the move. All right. Now we can talk about tomorrow. Um, you know, we, in the tour preview, we even thought that might be the deciding factor for the top GC battle. But now there's quite a battle between like third and seventh. Yeah. They, they could just yeah. be the most entertaining, one of the most entertaining things of the tour, this entire tour is yeah. watching that battle tomorrow. Yeah. And there's also the, there's also the King of the mountains, which is undecided. So that's going to depend. So, you know, that that's, I think that that's the first move is going to be Chicona needs to be in the break. He needs to score points on those. There's six category S clans tomorrow. The last two are cat once, and then the others are second and third. So, <clears throat> Chicona needs to be in the break. So that's the first battle. I think he, I mean, it's a short stage, 133 kilometers. Um, and then it's going to depend what, what Jonas Vingegaard does on those last two climbs and what Felix Gall does on those last two climbs, because he's still in contention for the King of the Mountains too. Uh, and then, yeah, from third to seventh, um, if you look, uh, the podium is still... In reach for Carlos Rodriguez, for example, it's a minute 16. Of course, that would mean that Adam Yates has a bad day, but it's not impossible. And then, yeah, Simon Yates uh, is in fifth. He's only 18 seconds behind fourth place. Yeah. Bilbao I, was, I, I was thinking how wild would it be if tomorrow's stage looks like the first stage? Yeah, that's si good. Simon and Adam Yates up there. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that would be something. That would be something. Um, but yeah, I mean, if Adam Yates is okay, it's you know, it's it's not the high mountains. But these last two climbs, JB, are you know, uh, it's a hard stage, 133 kilometers, six climbs from the gun. It's going to be war. Uh, guys who want to go in breakaways. And then, of course, the favorites will try to uh, battle it out on the last two climbs. But it's going to be it's going to be an interesting stage. Uh, not, of course, we know who's going to win the tour. But uh, and then, yeah, I mean, let's see also if Tadej Pogacar has completely recovered from his, you know, bad day. Um, I think, yes. And what if... He gives us a great show and tries to win the stage. Yeah. Which would be an ideal, you know, that's for, that's like the next best thing that can happen to him and UAE. Get the you stage know, winning, win. Winning that stage and then two guys on the podium. That kind of like say, okay, you know what? We, we, we've done, we've done fine. You know, we've done really well. Yeah. And you've said it, you know, Lance has said it, you know, anytime Pogacar pins a number on his back. He's racing. Mm. He's not going to yeah. just lay down and finish this tour if he yeah, feels no. good. If he feels good, he's going, he'll try to do something. Yeah. Well, I that's, mean, a, that's a good, that's a good scenario that you painted out. If he, if he gets the stage win, because Jonas Vingegaard has so much buffer, he just needs to manage and just ride his just own. goes with him, just goes yeah. with him and doesn't need to do anything. And yeah. uh, in this case, uh, the way this, this stage finishes, um, I could clearly see a, a victory for Pogacar, but mm. then he needs to be able, I mean, well, Vingegaard doesn't need to attack, you know, he, he, maybe he will, because that last climb, JB, is really, really, really hard. Uh, the, um, so you have the Petit Ballon, which is the, the second last climb, that's hard. 
But then that that last climb called you Platzerwasel. You with your German pronunciation, you could say that one. <laughs> Platzerwasel. Um, it's in the Vosges, so you know it's it's the the, uh, the Alsace, the area where close to Germany. So all the all the names you see there, you know the Markstein. That's also a German name where the finish is. Uh, but man, that's seven kilo, seven kilometer. That's eight point five percent, but with with a lot of stretches of like ten percent, nine and a half, ten again. Um, it's a good climb to attack to to really still uh, try to make some difference. Uh, not just not just for Vingegaard and and, and and Pogacar, but for number three, four, five, and six. You guys are going to have your work cut out for you for outcomes today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It's especially because it's not finished on top. So there right. could be a lot of strategy there from uh, the top of the Platz of Wazel. So that's 26. So it's still eight kilometers to the finish. Uh, yeah. That could be interesting. And you have an interesting fact. If you watch, uh, the Tour de France Femme last year, the women did this yeah. finish. Well, it's not not that not exactly that finish, but they one did, of these climbs. They did Petit Ballon and and Platza Wasel in the beginning of the stage. The strongest climber of the the women's peloton, Annemiek van Vleuten, went away there and did everything. I mean, she just destroyed the field, um, and then made it to the finish on her own. Uh, was the second? It was the second last stage because last the last stage finished on La Planche de Belfi. Um, but it, it is hard. It's you know, and at this stage in the tour, uh, it's only the top ten guys who say, "Okay, you know, we still we we can still do something." The whole, everybody else is say, "What the hell?" Yeah, and I like I said this on the move. The sprinters, you know, get up tomorrow and they're like, "I just I just want to sprint in Paris." Yeah. Not not this. The torture that sprinters go through to get their opportunities the, is tougher the, than ever. The bus, the Gruppetto, is going to be very large tomorrow. <laughs> very large. Very early. They're just going to call it, call it truce early. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, no, only normal. I mean, whoever, whoever doesn't have anything to do anymore in the GC, they're going to say, you know what? I'll just stay here and, you know... To, if if the bus is big enough, they they won't eliminate them. But it's, I mean, short stages like this, and uh, and hard stages like this are, are sometimes you know the, you know dangerous for not making the time cut. Mm. It's up and down, up and down. There's not there's nothing in between. Wow. Okay. It's going to be a fun stage to watch tomorrow. Um, And and a reminder, I just didn't mention uh, Tour de France. Um, We will be doing that just like we did last year. It starts on Sunday, same day Mm -hmm. the men men end. And it'll probably, it will be the women's coverage first for us on Sunday because on the final day in Paris, they end later. They try to end at sunset. Do I have that correct? I think so. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a late finish. They want the picture with the Arc de Triomphe and the the sun going down. Yeah. So that'll be the order of things there. This is your last chance for Ventum Trivia. All right. Somebody's going to win the bike on Sunday. Uh, today's, uh, you know, you can send in your question here. Oh, no, maybe actually there's two more today and tomorrow. But uh, the, the trivia question from yesterday, and they're going to accept two answers. Ventum said they'll accept two answers because one of them abandoned. Uh, but who was this year's youngest rider? So they'll accept uh, either Quinn Simmons, who uh, is age 22, but just a little bit younger than Carlos Rodriguez. Mm-hmm. So Carlos Rodriguez is still in, in it. So yesterday, if you send in either one of those answers, they'll accept it. Imagine, imagine this, JB, Carlos Rodriguez. He, so he's sitting in fourth in GC. He's the youngest rider, in the, in, and he doesn't have the white jersey. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, no, that's, just, that's cruel. I yeah. know. I know. It's <laughs> <laughs> everyone's waiting for Pogacar to get out yeah, of that. Next what, that... <laughs> well, next year, next year, today is not qualifying for the white jersey anymore. So I'm going to say, finally, man. Uh, today's <laughs> question 
you probably know this off the top of your head, but how many days did Eddie Merckx spend in a yellow jersey? I, I do. I don't know it. I, I asked a few people, you know, uh, um, just for fun, and they all guessed right about half of what they are. It's a, an astonishing uh, number. Wait, uh, hmm. <laughs> You want to throw out a number? Well, I'm sure it's more than 50. It's a lot more than 50. In the yellow jersey? A lot more than 50. Yeah. Unless they have it wrong in my notes. Yeah. But do the I homework. Mean, I, was just, I was just calculating, you know, five tours, 10 stages per tour, 50, more than 50. Yeah. More well, than I mean, 50. I said more than 50. I mean, that, I mean, okay. right. well, you're technically right. Yes. <laughs> You know what? You you could probably email Ventum more than fifty. That's a, that, that's a correct answer, and you'll go into the drawing. That's we'll, we'll play it like the Price is Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, send your answer to trivia at ventumracing dot com. All right. I'm really excited for somebody to win that 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 new bike. And let's tackle a few questions specifically for you, Johan. I think you'll like this. Uh, the first one <clears throat> comes from Chris. And says, uh, Sepp Kuss has raced an exceptionally difficult and successful Giro and Tour combo. The Pro Cycling Stats website shows him on a provisional start list for Jumbo for the Vuelta. Uh, I don't know what intelligence or lack thereof they have access in making this list. So I don't know the veracity of this. I'm curious your thoughts on it. Is this yeah. likely? Is it even possible in modern cycling? That's from Chris in yeah. Chicago. I've I've heard the same rumors. Uh, it's not confirmed. Um, it's possible. Yes, it's possible. Now the question is, is it really a smart thing to do? Uh, I, I know exactly what Jumbo Visma is thinking behind this. So obviously, Sepkus has been instrumental to. The victory of Primoz Roglic in the Giro. He's been instrumental here in the Tour, and and Roglic is racing the Vuelta. I, I do know that it's a big goal of Jumbo Visma to win all three Grand Tours in one season, and it, uh. it, is, it is very possible. You know, they won the Giro; they're going to win the Tour. Uh, if they win the Vuelta, I don't know if there's ever. I mean, a team who has done that before. Hmm. Um, maybe. Uh, but I don't know. Um, personally, I don't think what I see right now, I don't think it's it would be the smartest thing to do, uh, especially because Sepkus has been great, but the last few stages, he's been a bit weaker than we usually see him. And so that obviously, and that's normal. You know, there was not much time to recover. And in tomorrow, between. tomorrow we may get a good look at him too to see how he's. Yeah, doing. but tomorrow is not. It's not crucial, you know. It's uh, if he stays with 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 Jonas and just sets. They're managing, uh, uh, you know, uh, their pace. They don't need to set a pace to attack, right? They yeah. just he just needs to set. So tomorrow he he can do that, and they have other riders who are strong also. Uh, plus, you know, on stage 20, there's not, not that many guys anymore who can attack anyway. So it's not really a, a problem, but man, I, to do three, all three grand tours, uh, in his, in his role, I don't know, man, I don't know. Uh, I've seen the same information, but man, you know, and I, I, don't, on, I, don't, on the, I don't think, I don't think Sepkus is really jumping up and down to the Vuelta. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the heels of what we were talking about earlier, the the pace overall of these Grand yeah. Tours, it's so much more than 20 years ago, right? Overall. Yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, you, got, you know, could that, that could potentially just do some damage to you that's just, you just don't recover from, right? Yeah. I had a, I had a teammate back in the days who, who used to do all three, uh, and then still the, the, the Vuelta was in April. So, Vuelta, April, May, the Giro, and then July, July the Tour. Ugh. And and he did all three, a, a number of years. And he actually... Must, he, he must not have liked his home life. Well, I mean, he was, <laughs> he, he was a rider who just did it for training. And, you know, he trained 
And finally, I mean, one year he uh, he did all three Grand Tours and finished fifth in the Tour in oh, the last wow. of the three. So wow. impressive. Yeah. Uh, well, we would like American viewers would like to see Sepp Goose again, but we don't expect it, buddy. We don't expect it. You've done. No, enough. I mean, it, it depends. You would <laughs> like to Sepp. What, how what would you like to see? You want to let, see let Sepp Goose? As we used to see them, see him like being the 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 guy who puts the herd on the peloton and the climbs, or you want to see him at the start and then dragging himself. I know. I, the I yeah. I love I love seeing him being the the last on the train yeah. up the mountain. But yeah, yeah, that's yeah. too much. Well, it's a lot to ask. I personally think that you know at Jumbo Visma they are they they know what they're doing and they're gonna make the right decision. Uh. <sighs> If you ask me right now, he's not going. Okay. Uh, again, thank you for your uh, question, Chris. Uh, here's one from uh, Paolo. It says, uh, thanks for the show and the daily cycling education. It's been 47 years since the last Belgian winner. With Remco coming into the picture, hopefully next year, how do you rate his chances of competing with Jonas and Tade? Or are they simply streets ahead of everyone else? Mm -hmm. well, seven, what is it? 47 years? 47 years. Oh, and, it, so, and, so and, even, and it wasn't even, Merckx, which yeah, is I what know. everyone Lucien, would think. Yeah, it was Lucien Van Impe. Lucien Van Impe. Uh, a great climber. Uh, multiple times winner of the, uh, the polka dot jersey. Five or six, I think six times. Uh, or even more. I mean... Um, so we're even worse than France because the, the last French rider was Eno, and that was in 82 or 83, I think. Uh, maybe, no, no, 85. Yeah, 85. Um, okay, well, Remco, um, it's difficult to say right now. You know, he's, so he's done one grand tour where he could really show everything he had was the Vuelta. He won. Um, he had to abandon this, this year's Giro with COVID and then, uh, the other Giro, um, he was just not ready. He was just not ready for it after his, after his big crash, uh, in Lombardy. So we have not seen for the moment enough from Remco in the high mountains to be able to say, and, and day after day after day to be able to say, he can be up there with with Tadei and Jonas. Uh, let's say physically, you would say, yeah. I mean, he does have the qualities. He's a good climber and he's a great time trialist. So you need to have those two qualities at least to be up there. Then there's the question of the team. You know, but will, can he have a team strong enough to support him? Uh, for the moment, Sudok Quickstep is definitely weaker than Jumbo Visma and UAE. So next year we have to see what will happen, right? Will the will the team be able to strengthen them themselves? And uh, and it would be the first time that Remco races the tour. Uh, the way I see it right now, I don't think he's up up there yet with those guys. Uh, he would need to do one or two tours to be able to really see and, and and get used to the level of the tour which is miles ahead of the giro and the vuelta you know look at for example look at jay hindley jay hindley was second in the giro and he won the giro and now he's seventh in the tour yeah, yeah. you know no it's, it's not you can't compare it's a different game the tour de france Okay. And that'll make for a, a, a reason to tune in when we do our trades and transfers off season show, we can look at it, uh, at Sudal quick step and see who they might've picked up that could support him in that effort. So yeah. I look forward to that show. One more question for you. I know we're running a little bit long. You've got a lot to do and we're running a little later today, but I, I think you'll like this. Um, we know about riders and breakaways talking with each other, working together, but during the race, are race directors ever talking to each other uh, about deals or working together? That's mm -hmm. from Sam in Maryland. Well, they definitely used to. <laughs> uh, you know, there was always talks going on, always talking about common and joint interests, right? Like 
uh, on a flat stage, there's usually some kind of agreement between teams who have a sprinter, you know, there's a breakaway. Two or three teams who have a sprinter, they make an agreement, let's say, we're, okay, we're each of us are going to use two of our guys to keep this breakaway under control. That still happens. Uh, but it does happen less and less. Uh, I can see a lot of times that teams just set out a strategy. Uh, the strategy is based on data, on power output, especially like, for example, Jumbo Visma, they done it like two or three times. They said, okay, this is, this is our stage. We're, this is what we're going to do. We know that our team can go, the whole team can go 5.5 watts per kilo over these climbs. We don't care what happens in the race. We don't care what other teams do. That's what we do. And we know that by the end of the stage, we're going to be close enough to the front of the race so that our leaders can try to win the stage. Um, so that happens a lot more before that didn't happen. You were always kind of, you had a strategy and then you were trying to adapt your strategy either to the circumstances or to what other teams were doing. And I see that that's happening less and less. Okay. Thanks again, Sam, for your question. Uh, tomorrow will probably be the last day we field questions on JB Squared. You can send it to JB Squared, JB2 at we do dot team. All right, Johan, we're getting there. We're getting there. A couple more days yeah. ahead of us. Two our, more our days. Team, you seem fine. The, 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 the team down the hall is getting weak. They're, <laughs> they're running out of gas. So uh, thank you for your time, Johan, and we'll talk tomorrow. Okay. Thanks, JB. Speak tomorrow. Yeah.